language instructors. I, I've uh, been spending a bit of time in administration lately, and it's actually quite a pleasure to be here and actually be talking about sort of what got us into the business in the first place. Um, so yeah, my name is Jason Merrill. I've been teaching Russian here at Michigan State for 15 years or so. Um, taught in various other places before coming to Michigan State. Um, some people classify Russian as a little, some don't. It all depends on, I'm sure that's a separate conversation that you've been having. Um, but here in a small program at Michigan State, we face an issue that probably a lot of you do as well. Um, in Russian, we used to have the traditional four years of language, 101, 102, 201, 202, 301, and so on, 401, 402. Um, but soon after I arrived at MSU, due to low enrollments, we were asked, encouraged, to review our curriculum and come up with a strategy that would address the enrollment issue, but also renew the curriculum and give us a chance to go beyond the traditional third year and fourth year, but also try to do something exciting with our courses as well. So we did a bit of planning, after which we settled on replacing the two years of 301, 302, 401, 402 uh, with four content-based modular courses, we call them. Um, and I, sorry, I forgot to make a slide out of this one, but basically there's Russian 420, which is the one I'm teaching right now, which is Russia from 862 until World War I. Uh, there's 421, which will be in the spring, the Soviet era. Uh, 440, which I will teach next fall. Unfortunately, it always coincides with elections in Russia, so we have a lot to talk about on contemporary Russia. And then 441, which will be in the spring of 2019, which will, is, a, is a Russian literature introduction. And those four just rotate. There's a two-year rotation, so we don't have 300-level courses anymore. We just have reserved that number for study abroad. And after second year, students can jump in and take any of those that they want. We've really tried to design them for maximum <coughs> flexibility so they don't even have to be taken in order. Uh, we coordinate the grammar topics. I teach the two fall courses, but a colleague of mine teaches the <coughs> spring ones. Um, and one of our goals is also to introduce students to a wide range of cultural texts, cultural topics the kinds of things that Russians know well, cultural literacy. Um, like with any language, when it's not just learning all of the words, but it's sort of the text, the things that people talk about all the time, and just even uh, sort of you know, subconsciously cite all the time. Um, so one major emphasis in all of our classes is working with authentic materials, and really one of the main points we're going to talk about today as we talk about the differentiated classroom is how to use such materials at all proficiency levels. So as you can imagine then, in my classes, in the 400 level, we have a wide range of students. We have students who have only had two years of Russian. We have students who have had two years of Russian plus study abroad. Three years of Russian, three years of Russian plus study abroad. Um, students with two or three years and some other intensive or even immersive experience out of a couple of um, students in my former global class right now, for example, who took a summer at, um, spent last summer at Middlebury with me as well. And we also, of course, heritage speakers. I assume a lot of you, how many of you have various types of heritage speakers in your class? That's exactly the show of hands I expected, exactly. We have a lot of them too. Uh, we don't have enough to dedicate specific classes to them, but we have just enough to where their needs really need to be taken into account. And as you know, heritage speakers um, there, there are all sorts of them. The five that I have out of the 16 students in my 400 level class right now um, are fairly different. And each one requires some sort of individual attention as we're working through things. Did you ever have anyone with just one year of Russian in such courses? Not in ours, because 200 level is a prerequisite. Okay, okay. So no, I would push them back. I'd say, slow down. One more year. <laughs> So I assume that you, with your smaller classes, often face similar challenges. Some students know more, some are more confident speakers, some know grammar really well, some don't know grammar at all, but speak very confidently. Um, there's no perfect solution, at least that I know of. Um, if anybody here knows about that, let me know and we can all go to lunch early, I guess. Um, but today I'd like to present some ideas that can really help you work, hopefully with such varied groups, and introduce some current best practices at the same time. 
So my personal solution to the issue of multiple levels in my language classroom has come in the actual proficiency guidelines. Um, who feels comfortable here? I use that term, the actual proficiency guidelines. Raise your hand, you feel comfortable with them. Oh, okay, great, good. We'll work with them some more, so if not, don't worry about it. We'll be partnering up later and working with them. Um, they're important because, just like me, you're likely to have students of varying proficiency levels in your classrooms. Um, so first of all, what are they? It's Axel's own description of what the proficiency guidelines are. The guidelines describe the task that speakers can handle at each level, as well as the content context, accuracy, and discourse types associated with tasks at each level. They also present the limits that speakers encounter when attempting to function at the next higher major level. It's from the 2012 guidelines. Um, and how are they organized? First of all, there are, of course, major proficiency levels, as you know. We're starting at the top here, novice, intermediate, advanced, superior, and the recently introduced distinguished. We're really going to be focusing on the first three today, novice, intermediate, and advanced, because students in undergraduate program rarely test at the superior level. Um, although, of course, the whole question of heritage speakers is off to the side. But our more traditional undergrads aren't reaching that, typically, in undergraduate programs. The guidelines, one of the really important things to remember and that we're really going to focus on today is the guidelines focus on the types of things that students can do. What can they do with the language? What can they do at each level? It's not what do they know. You know have they memorized these hundred words? Can they conjugate verbs correctly? What can they actually do? Can they go to Russia and you know, can they order a meal? Can they successfully introduce themselves? And so on. Things like that. Um, it talks about functions, not <coughs> knowledge of particular word sets or particular constructions. The guidelines are also very helpful, just as a side note, for helping us to temper our expectations, to make sure our expectations for students and their outcomes are, are realistic to where they are. Um, so, for example, novice level speaking. Novice level speakers can communicate short messages and highly predictable everyday topics that affect them directly. They do so primarily through the use of isolated words and phrases that have been encountered, memorized, and recalled. It may be difficult to understand even by the most sympathetic interlocutors accustomed to non-native speech. They're like our kids. We understand them, but put them in the middle of other native speakers, and suddenly it's a lot harder to understand them, at least those native speakers who are not, like us, used to dealing with students like this. Um, so what are the key parts here? We're dealing with native with novice speakers. It's your it's your first year classroom right about not anybody teaching first year this year? Okay. This is your students where they are right now. What are the important pieces here? Short messages. Short. Everyday right. Everyday topics. Everyday topics. Uh, lists. Lists. Yep. Limited and predictable vocabulary. Predictable vocabulary that usually comes from Right from the textbook, memorized, exactly. And we're very happy when they regurgitate from the textbook to us, right? I mean, that's, that's really what we're working isolated, at this level. Isolated words. Isolated words, right. We're not, there aren't smooth sentences yet. There's certainly not the paragraphs that we're going to see at the advanced level. Um, things that affect them directly. Students in first year at the novice level are talking mostly about themselves. Me, 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 me. What happens when we even switch to, I'm sure almost all of you do this, my name is, and you suddenly switch to, what's his name? And they say, my name is, <laughs> because it's that, that memorized phrase. And keep all of this in mind. But also that's an encouragement to, that also gives us something that we know we need to work on as well. Um, second or third person are very, it's very difficult at this point, but gives us something to keep in mind. Good. As we progress into the intermediate level, we have this. Speakers at the intermediate level are distinguished primarily by their ability to create with the language when talking about familiar topics related to their daily life. 
able to recombine learned materials, personal meaning, simple questions, straightforward survival situation. I am hungry. Please give me food. Things like that. Uh, they produce sentence level language, ranging from discrete sentences to strings of sentences, typically in present time. They're understood by people who are, uh, again, accustomed to dealing with non-native learners of the language. What are the important things here? So we've, we've progressed. This may be your second year, third year, and we're dealing with the intermediate level now. Create with the language. They're able to create. Create with the language. Good. Um, that means in the textbook it says, I bought a book, but I know the word for radio. I'm able to say, I bought a radio. This is the way, this is the, the, the recombining learned material as well. Good. What else? What else is important here? Personal, Personal meaning. Question. What's that? Personal meaning. Personal meaning. We're still mostly talking about, it's still mostly me, me, me. Yeah. Asking questions. Asking questions. Asking questions is really difficult for students at the novice level. Really, really difficult. Uh, but it's something we still want to practice. And it's really one of the hallmarks of the, in, of the intermediate level. Suddenly I am able to ask questions. So it's another thing to work on. Good. What else is here? What's that? Sentence level language. Suddenly we're talking in what sentences. Is? Right. If, 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 you're, you know, if a student is assessed at the intermediate level, that means that this student is capable of always speaking in complete sentences. Or even strings of sentences. But not yet an actual paragraph. Good. What else here? Anything else we see here? Present time frame. Tense. Right. We're still, and this will vary from language to language. I don't see. Yeah, it's somewhere here. Right, here we go. Um, but like in Russian, for example, the future tense is really difficult. And even in, at the advanced level, there's a lot of trouble. When, when you can narrate in the future tense tomorrow, I will go to the store, I will do this, and we'll do that, in Russian, you definitely hit advanced. Yeah, that's one of the hallmarks of the advanced. Um, but keep in mind, it's still related to daily life. Still very concrete. Um, we move to the advanced level. Even the descriptions get bigger and bigger here. Um, what's important here at the advanced level? Other topics. Topics of community, national, international interest. One of this is again on the OPI. We'll get the classic examples of you know, tell me about some current event. Tell me about something that's important in the country you're studying and why. There's even cultural and um, current event information is being dropped in here. Good? Paragraphs. Paragraphs? I heard. Past the time frames of the past, present, and future. All the major time frames, right. So all, all our tenses should be more or less, there's still going to be mistakes, and probably a lot of them, but more or less the, time, the tenses have to all be there. More narration and description. Lots of narration. This, mm -hmm. the, the abstract prompts will often be something described in detail. Whereas it's not the two or three sentences you get at the intermediate level, but it's tell me in detail, and I want a lot of details. You know, minute by minute what you did yesterday versus the two things you are able to say yesterday. Um, what else? Uh, anything else? Uh, Personal meaning. We have, right, they're a lot easier to understand. Notice that also they can actively participate in a conversation. It's not just you are asking questions and really pulling teeth. You are, there is a true kind of back and forth here. Um, can also handle something unexpected. I'm sure all of you can think of, you know, during, the, during a, a real OPI exam, there's always that unexpected event uh, or the scenario that we do. You, you lost a library explain how you're going to you know, go to the library, explain what happened, and then figure out a situation. You don't know how it's going to end, and you have to deal with that unexpected outcome there. Um, just because I know you're curious, here's the, here's the superior description, but we're not really going to um, stay on this one for very long. The, at the superior level, we're also able to make hypotheses as well, and, and certainly in the case of Russian, it's the last sort of um, grammatical hurdle in there, and we're much more demanding in terms of grammatical accuracy. But even students here will make occasionally a mistake. 
occasionally make mistakes. They just can't be sort of systematic ones that repeat. They have to be isolated ones. Um, to help us, so those are the major levels. To help us further determine where our students are in terms of proficiency, each of the first three levels, the ones we'll be talking about today, are divided into sub-levels. Superior and distinguished are not. Um, here, for example, is the description of novice mid. And this will take the basic novice framework and try to <coughs> narrow it down even more. Um, and here we have novice mid. Communicate min minimally by using a number of isolated words and memorized phrases limited by the particular context in which the language has been learned. I.e., if your textbook has already covered my house, the store, then I could say one or two things about my room and one or two things about the store, maybe list a couple of words from there. Um, they pause frequently. They attempt to recycle their own and your words. Um, very difficult to understand. This, even at the novice mid, we're talking about a lot of lists in isolated words. Here's the intermediate low. So we've jumped into the intermediate level. The big thing that as we jump into the intermediate, of course, is now we're now creating in, in complete sentences, but barely. You know, we, we're over the threshold and we can do everything that we saw listed before, but just barely. There are going to be a lot of pauses. The speech is going to be very rough, but we are there. Lots and lots of still basic personal information with some examples there. Speakers are primarily reactive, struggle to answer direct questions or requests for information. Able to ask a few questions. Questions are still difficult at the intermediate low level, however. Um, so the sublevels are low, mid, and high. As you sense here, low speakers almost never function at the next highest level. So intermediate lows, you're probably never going to see anything advanced level out of them. At the mid sub level, however, they're going to function as high as 50% of the time at the next level. And at the high sub level, they're almost always there. But there are breakdowns there. So some things to keep in mind. Don't expect too much. Be realistic. Students in first year are not going to create paragraphs about abstract topics. So we don't want to give them assignments that ask them to do that. We want to make assignments that are very level appropriate. So where are our students typically? Well, I'll give you the example of Russian. At Michigan State, in Russian, students after one year are at, in, are at novice mid to high probably closer to hot. But there are still a couple who are stuck at mid. Excuse me. Yes. Just for clarity, when you say year, do you mean semester or do you mean two semesters? I mean two semesters, excuse okay. me, okay. an academic okay. Okay. year. Okay. So if I say after first year, I mean after 101 and 102. Thank you okay. for the okay. clarification. And how many hours need to be there? At, Rush, at Michigan State, there are going to be four contact hours a week okay. for us. Okay. And every language is different. Just sort of, sort of throwing out a general, you know, sort of general language orientation. Language use different orthography. Students will take more time to get to yeah. this level. Yes, and in the case of Russian, that doesn't take very long. In fact, there's always that, that wonderful moment sometime in the beginning of October where somebody says, I haven't taught first year for years, but I, and I miss this moment, but somebody says, Professor Merrill, I was taking notes in chemistry today, and I started writing in Russian. <laughs> and we know we got it. I know that um, our students. But say those of you that have other alphabets, right? Arabic, and that's going to that will yeah. slow things down um, in certain skills more than others. It yes. may not affect. You'll see, especially in the beginning, that the writing and reading might be behind mm -hmm. the speaking. Yeah. That's that's totally normal, and they will all catch up eventually. Yeah. Yes. Do you teach the script together with the you know? Those levels, or do you teach the we just teach it. In Russian, it's easy for us. We, we just teach it. The first three days of 101, here's the alphabet. Let's practice, practice, practice. And then we assume it's, yeah. We, we have it fairly easy. And that's it. So I can't offer any more advice about dealing with uh, more complicated scripts. 
Um, so after one academic year, they're typically novice mid, more novice high. After two years, most have made that jump into intermediate low. Three or four years, they're an intermediate mid. Um, you've probably seen this. Um, and what the, the famous actual inverted pyramid shows us is, is that, especially through the novice level, we can make progress pretty quickly in, t in these terms. But as we start getting into, say, intermediate mid, for example, you know, there's a reason why I can have a student in third year Russian, fourth year Russian, and be intermediate mid all of the time. It doesn't mean they're not learning things. They just haven't yet gotten to that next level. Keep this in mind as well, because students are not going to go, they're going to go from novice low to novice mid probably in a couple of weeks in your classroom, but in terms of jumping from level to level, that's going to slow down as we, as we move up here. So I have a question. So are you referring to a specific skill, speaking or it's general? What I've shown you so far is speaking. Uh -huh. I'm going to show you some writing speaking examples. Yeah, yeah, but there, but one of the things that I want to encourage you to do as you're thinking about creating exercises is to borrow from all of them. There's going to be a specific reason that I show you the writing ones right before we watch a video and make our own exercises. Because I think the writing ones have some really good suggestions for concrete exercises hidden in them. So I really encourage you to look at all of them, not just the speaking Others? Um, and of course, we have course names in some places like beginning, intermediate, advanced, but that's here we're talking about this, we're specifically talking about the proficiency levels. And no matter where our students are, we want to pay attention to two levels. We want to pay attention to the level that they're on currently, and the next one, that is where do we want them to be? If we keep in mind the next level as well, then we'll be designing exercises, we'll be giving them things to do that are going to help them get to that, connect, that next level. Do scaffold exercises carefully to get them to practice the next higher level, if that's your goal in a particular exercise. If our students are at the intermediate level, we want them to be working at the intermediate, intermediate high, and advanced. If we give them advanced level stuff, make sure the exercises are properly scaffolded. Make sure that we have plenty of materials that we need. Don't just suddenly say, write a full, complete paragraph on this. Give the words that they need, the connectors, first of all, second of all, third of all. Give them lots and lots of guidance, and they will do a much better job of creating um, what you want. And we don't want them to get discouraged, of course. Uh, if your students are at the intermediate level, also don't spend much time, if any at all, with novice level exercises. They'll get bored, uh, and it won't find, they won't find it terribly useful. But I don't think anybody here goes to a third year class and says, make a list of 10 things you're going to buy at the store, and so on. Good. If our students are at the novice level, you're looking at using novice level exercises and intermediate level ones with proper scaffolding, giving again everything they need to successfully complete an exercise. Nothing at the advanced level. It's too far ahead. Um, but keep this range in mind. It's easy to forget, especially if we say to ourselves, well, boy, it sure would be great if they learned how to, to write in paragraphs, so I'm just going to tell them to do that. Um, so we can use the actual guidelines to assess where our students are, but they can help us do more, because they can actually help us create level-appropriate exercises that will help them continually develop proficiency. They tell us what students, because they tell us what students can do, but also what they should be able to do as they move up levels. So I want to spend the rest of the session doing just this, using the guidelines to create some exercises for various levels, mostly novice and intermediate. We'll see if we have time to get to the advanced level as well. Um, how many of you speak Russian? I thought there was I'm one or two. OK. <laughs> um, that's great. And I, I figured that would be the case. So in fact, I picked a short film that is Russian, but is silent. It doesn't have any words in it at all. Uh, the setting is Russian, but we're focusing, yeah. here we'll be focusing on action, not language. So our possibilities might be somewhat limited because there isn't any language to talk about. But you'll see that, especially at the lower levels, students comprehend a lot through visual clues. Almost as much as through language, if not more than through language. Um, so please definitely don't forget the visual 
if you're watching film, for example. If you're watching films, choose ones with lots of actions. It may, it may not be the greatest cinema from your particular tradition, but at this point, we really want to give students things to talk about, things with lots of things happening, lots of verbs that they can use. Um, we're, going to use we're going to view a short film in just a second. Um, but before we watch it, I want to look at examples, as I just said, from the actual proficiency guidelines for writing. I chose them because they have important key words for creating level appropriate exercises. So here's the novice ones. Writers at the novice level are characterized by the ability to produce, produce lists and notes, primarily by writing words and phrases. They can provide limited formulaic information on simple forms and documents. These writers can reproduce practice materials to convey the most simple message. In addition, they can transcribe familiar words or phrases, copy letters of the alphabet, don't let this discourage you, or reproduce basic characters with some accuracy. We've got a first year class like you guys are teaching now. We want to incorporate a real film, a real short film, animation like I do. Um, the students are all on a novice level. What are some key words here? as we're thinking about, I'm not, because you're not just going to show them the film. You never just press play and say, hey guys, let's talk about this film. Especially, you know, we're going to put a whole apparatus around it here. Um, well, what are just some key words? We don't have to get too detailed, but what are the words that jump out at you as you're thinking about creating exercises for them? Lists. Lists. Notes. Notes. Formulaic. Formulaic. Words and phrases. Formulaic. Right. Is this anything like, what do we have in our textbook? Let's use some textbook information and structures that we have talk about this. Practice materials, simple messages. Transcribe familiar words or phrases. You know, one exercise could even be, you know, write down all the street signs that you see as we're watching the film or something like that. You know, don't forget that part. That's harder than it seems. Um, intermediate level. So this may be a lot of you that are late second year, third year, depending on your language. Um, <coughs> What are some key words here that jump out as you're thinking about creating exercises? Simple messages. Letters. I love the old letter. I, I do tons of letters. We're watching a classic Russian film right now, and I have a writing assignment after every episode, and it usually takes the form of a letter. Pretend you are this character. Write a letter to the police and explain what happened. Write a letter to your landlord and say what just happened and how you're going to fix the situation. Things like that. Uh, that that I can. I'm sure my students are sick of writing letters and pretending that they're different characters. <laughs> but I think it's really great practice. Request for information. There's our questions again. Notes. Ask and respond to simple questions. Create. Communicate simple facts. Loosely connected sentence. Present tense. Um, basic vocabulary and structures. That's great. Um, in case we get to the advanced level, here's the advanced level. Informal and some formal correspondence. So this can even be more formal register. You know, pretend you are the leader of a delegation that is coming to Michigan State University. Write a letter to the president requesting um, to see her, and things like that. Where where it's, they're required to write slightly more formal. Summaries of a factual nature. Narratives and descriptions. Tell a story. Describe something in detail. Summarize the episode. If you have future tense, one of the things I love to do is also to practice the future. What's going to happen in the next episode? Predict. So and so will do this, do that. Paraphrase, elaboration, paragraphs. What I want to do now is, we're going to keep this alive, we're going to watch I said I'm going to watch a 10 minute video that has no words in it, but it has a lot of action. Keep in mind, let, let me tell you what we're going to do. So we're going to view this. Then I'm going to go back and put the novice description up there. You are going to partner up and I'm going to give you five, six minutes oh. to create exercises. <laughs> so you have to pay attention and pay attention closely and be thinking about the different levels here, and create some 
level specific, level appropriate exercises, and we'll just share them all with the group. Questions so far? Then enjoy the myth. Thank <laughs> you. 
Everyone who has a dog, come participate in the race. Okay, I think a film with lots of action, lots of visuals, um, you know, not lots of intellectual conversation where you have to understand everything that every character is saying. Um, just one question before we start. When a 
We're writing instructions for exercises. What language will we put them in? What do you think? It depends on the level we have. Okay. Um, how does it depend on? The level? I mean, for I mean, the novice level. Maybe I would use English. Okay. What's the argument for using English? I mean, even if you are even if you are a proponent of you know maintaining, like I, I just substituted in first year Russian the other day and spoke only Russian the whole time. Um, but I would definitely put my instructions in English. Why? What's the you argument? Want them for that? To understand the past. Yeah, you want to make sure they understand what we're doing. And you're evaluating them on the production, not on the question. And we're evaluating them on production exactly. We're we're not evaluating. Under, how to understand instructions because instructions tend to be fairly complex language, right? They don't know verb, they don't know some of these words. Um, so I'm a proponent of doing them in English. I disagree in a little about that, and I, I think hear. it's fine. I, I think it's fine, but I think you can do both, and okay. there are arguments in both. But yep. I'm not. No, oh, there are. No one has convinced me yet, and I'm maybe one day they will. First of all, I think. They are not easy, but they are very repetitive. So after three days, they know. Usually, they tend to be repetitive. Oh sure, after so three days. So they can learn, you know, like not uh, getting what's what like write blah blah blah, like make a list of blah blah blah. So that's not first one. Second, mm -hmm. there are sometimes classes, not maybe our classes, but I've taught Spanish for foreigners with ten different mother tongues in my class, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were fine, like with instructions in Spanish. So not always you have students that English is their mother tongue. Mm -hmm. So if you have a study abroad student from Definitely. I don't know where, Definitely. maybe English is not helpful Then that's at the all. way to go with ensuring so, that they understand. No, so, I mean, I'm just saying that it's not always that evident that Absolutely. Them. And third thing, I think it's a little bit, it's nice to keep with the, uh, depending also probably with the language, but for me as a student, it helped me to keep with the target language in class, mm -hmm. stay with the target language as much as possible, and not switching and code switching all the time, even if I, if you may do the exercise inside your brain. So I think that right before a task, switching to English and then coming back to the target language, I'm not even sure if that's that useful. And those are so all those strong are my questions, like, for uh, that, but I, I would also point out that let's say we're going to build an example or an exercise for this like you're about to do. If I put in Russian, make a list of all the animals that you saw in this episode, what am I going to get? Well, traditionally, I'm going to if you look at the book, for example, Portuguese, 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 Port
but yeah, and they could work together and see if they can figure out. They, I mean, they would have um, basic words like they're playing and things like that. So it's just an yeah. infinitive, right? Mm -hmm. Not no, I would have a oh, yeah. sentence. I would say what are they doing, and they would use so, the pronoun. Or something like this could even be a matching okay. exercise. Yeah. Here are five yeah. characters, yeah. Yeah. here are five yeah. verbs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we have that matching. Yeah. Then retell it as a sentence. There, yeah, some sort of fault. That's a good yeah, idea. I, I would include the pronoun so they would do something. Okay, yeah. good. Others? Who does what? Who does what is a yeah. version of this. Okay, good. Yes? Color. Oh. Color. If we're making lists. What are some of the things we could... We're doing a lot of lists at, at this level. Well, we could. Yeah. What are some things we could list? Intercultural competence. We can talk about Russian. What do you see there that you know is Russian? Uh, I would do that. If you know how English, to say Japanese, snow maybe. and cold, would okay. be novice, you can say that. Family yeah, they do. If cold. they have those, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in addition to what the others were saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so lost on that one. Would you please like, say that again? Like, sorry, would you explain in that context? So, one semester, would you please repeat, repeat what you just said? I'm yes. trying to wrap my around to understand what you said. I'm. In addition to what the others said about knowing verbs, and I'm talking about culture. I understand, but in this context... In I this context, know. I could say, uh, from what you know about Russian culture, what did you see here? And just name some nouns. Ah, okay. I see or, what Or, yeah, they can say snow. Okay, gotcha. Uh, they, yeah. But so so the instructions there would have to be in English. Very, yeah, very. Whether related or not. Choose, yeah. here's a list of ten words. Otherwise, choose from. Yeah, choose from. from. Like that, right? So, but the instructions there would be in, right, in English. Yes. Okay, that's what I want to thank you. Of course. Okay. Let's do the listing that we were mentioning before. People mentioned colors. We mentioned... Size of the clothing. Clothing. So you can have objects and then their colors. So it can have the Okay, yeah, yeah. objects and colors. Animals. I heard somebody else animals. say family members, animals. Yeah, kids, yeah. Terms, friendship terms. Yeah. Anything like that. Okay. Good. Numbers, different types. Yes. We were thinking about a previewing uh, exercise activity mm -hmm. before that so the students would be more, you know, even uh, getting their attention into what was going to happen. So we thought about, uh, uh, like, before doing the, the, the video, uh, do you have a pet? What's your pet's name? Mm -hmm. How old is the pet? Mm -hmm. The gender of the pet? How big or small is the pet? Mm -hmm. For one Color. thing. Let's describe your yep. Color, describe your pet. And also, where do you live? Is it a house or an apartment? Who mm -hmm. do you live with? Mm -hmm. So having questions very close to their own life, then viewing yep. the video, and after that, they would be able to uh, talk about uh, the, the pack too, and uh, we thought about uh, uh, action. Yeah? Action uh, verbs. Yeah. And what they are doing, and uh, probably match the mother is doing this, mm -hmm. the girl is doing that. Something you definitely want to do, and, and this was on my point, is you definitely want to go from yeah. that, take that step, whether you do it as a previewing exercise, and one thing we don't have time to talk about is what you do before you actually view, but you want to get them nice and warmed up for all of this, yeah. or afterwards, is take this content, and you can easily do this even on the novice level, and make it real for them. Do you like dogs or cats? Do you have a dog? What's its name? Um, remembering to supply vocabulary that they don't have. Mm -hmm. Does your partner like dogs, yes or no? Anything you've asked them, they can ask their partners and they can report back in third person. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, just, some, just some quick ideas so that we can look at intermediate too. Lists of anything. This can be a particular vocab set, as we said, colors, rooms, animals. <coughs> um, <coughs> true or false? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These, one of the good things about true-false ones is they can model more complex constructions. They don't have to know every word in a sentence that is true-false. But as they're reading it and determining whether it's true or false, they are already <laughs> learning more complex constructions. I'm a huge fan of true-false constructions. I'm also a big fan of who said what. This helps them, if we do it as a previewing exercise, if you're watching a, a series where they already know the characters, Here's a real clip. Who do you think says it? That way they've already seen a clip from it, they've heard it, 
and when they hear it, they'll actually understand it. Um, <clears throat> listen for particularly easy words, like greetings. If you have a scene where people are greeting each other, which greeting did they use, which form and why? Um, do you like this film? Yes or no? We can do it on a basic level, but they'll probably need some extra vocabulary and construction assistance. Um, assignments like this can always include useful constructions, or use at least three of the following in your answer, something like that. Um, let's quickly look at the intermediate level. Or, another one that I thought of afterwards, to make it more personal. You are the girl in the mitten. Fill out an application. Job applications are always a big one, too. <laughs> Apply to be in something. Why? Because that gives, they have to understand all the little lines. Um, I know in first year we will sometimes use, whenever we're in Russia, we always grab applications at, you know, McDonald's and places <laughs> like that and bring them back. Because it has all that personal information just in a very real context. <coughs> You're the girl in the mitten. Fill out an application to adopt a dog you know, with personal information. Or an application to join a dog lover's club or something like that. Another level? Sure. So they would they put like words. This word that it's uh, words. It's gotcha. words. Last name. Just like a job application. Yeah, gotcha. Last name. Yeah. First name. Age. Street. City. Gotcha. And so on like that. Yeah, yeah they can be really you good. You have to, you know, do the, the library card. You have to apply exactly. yeah. the library exactly. card. Yeah, there's hundreds of variations on the same basic thing, getting them through. Oh, I'm sorry, I had flipped it in my mind. I was thinking that you want to see what, ki what kind of dog you want, kind, friendly, happy, but mm -hmm. now I get you, I'm so oh. sorry. That might be the next level, keep okay. that in mind. <laughs> um, intermediate, we already looked at this, I'm only going to give you five minutes this time, go. This is third year or so, somewhere in there, when you know your students have reached the intermediate level, or if they're a little higher in the novice and you want to stretch them along and get them there. If they're at the intermediate level, yeah. <coughs> somewhere in there. The important thing is to determine their level first, and then we're going to go. make some interesting media sections. Go. Then you can, you know, you can see what is the weather like now. Well, what is the weather in New York? Tell us about the weather in New York. 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 Yeah, especially at the intermediate level, they're starting to So maybe who was black? The big dog. The big dog. When I saw black black white, I was feeling happy. But we were both in the outside. I think outside is good. They cannot describe the neighborhood. 
Yeah, that's how it is. So I got that sort of abstract. What about the... At least in Canada. What happens in... Yeah, I think it's just not Okay, there we go. Good. That's, that's, I think, would fit in here. Yeah, Good. And then what the other one would be the interview. The girl interviews the woman to see if she's a good fit for her pet. Intermediate level, we're yeah. asking questions. Yes. Pretend you are interviewing the potential adopter of your dog. Ask them three questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Good, good, good. Very level appropriate. Yes. We've talked about one that we could ask them to write, let's say, four sentences in present tense telling about four events in chronological order. Okay. And then, and then, uh, good, good. And, and then we also thought about, pretend you as a girl, write a, a letter to your mom asking for the dog for Christmas and telling what, what, what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain? Yeah, because we can, we can start argumentation here. They're explaining one of my favorite questions at this level is why, why, why. And the answers are going to be elementary at first, but we want to get them used to that negotiate. Good. One idea I thought it was also, since it's a, a movie that is built, you could say, you know, write a small dialogue between the mother and the girl. And, uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Good. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to jump in because I see we only have seven minutes left. Um, some ideas that I have. Who does what? You can give a complete <laughs> sentence description of an action and have them say who does it. Who participates in a race? And again, you can give words, we can give sentences where they don't know all of the words because they're not trying to, they don't have to understand the whole sentence. They have to try to figure out, match it with a character and then they will put the... In Russian, basically, all you do is re you replace the character name with who, but then they're giving back complete sentence models here. Um, 
use the most common verbs. Even with the most common verbs, this could work on the novice level too. In what order? I think we got a version of this of this here. Right. Put pieces of the plot in order. You just give them a bunch of sentences, have them put it in order. Always include a distractor. Always include at least one sentence that doesn't actually happen in the film. That's or at least I'm a big proponent of that. Just to make sure they're paying attention. Otherwise, they get to that last one and figure, okay, that must be the last one. Um, and the pieces, when they're joined together, could actually model a good paragraph. And they could even start with you. Know, well, they could. You could have them put in first of all, second of all, but taken together, could model a good paragraph. Yes. Yes. Pardon me. Uh, will there be a reading comprehension? Because people use put the event in the order when we give them the reading comprehension. Make sure that the reading is a comprehension of the text. Absolutely. So, if I want to put the event in the order, no, it is. I'm just using the writing list to come up with all sorts of exercises. Yep, no, that's. Um, think up X number of questions to ask your partner about the film. Then report their answers. This gets into constructions like he said, she said, as your partner's telling you about the film. Interview somebody else in the class about the film. Um, remember at this point, we want to get beyond just yes, no questions, and we want to get to more complex questions than that. Ones that require factual answers, one that require opinion answers, why? Shorter writing assignments, I mentioned I'm a huge fan of these. I have my students at this level write every day for homework. Every day they're writing a small paragraph. Every day. Retell the plot of the story. It could be something big, like just retell a plot, or it could be something a lot more focused, like the exercise and suggestions we had here. Pretend you're the little girl. Write three to four sentences to your mom explaining what kind of dog you want. Changing points of view can be really fun. Pretend you're the mom. Explain to your daughter why you don't want a dog in the house. I always offer right. options. I try to tell my students, write on one of these two. Because normally one of the two will grab them more than another one. And when students are engaged with the topic, they're going to write a lot more. I'm getting really good answers this year in my class. Describe your dog or cat. Describe your ideal dog or cat. Um, pretend you're the girl who saw the girl with the mitten. Describe what you saw. Remember that other girl that was walking by there and kind of went, what's she doing with her mitten? You know, pick unusual viewpoints like that. Some of them will really engage the students. Um, okay, in the three minutes we have left. So, back to the question of differing levels in our classrooms. It's important for you to first, or at least this is what I do. First, I get a, a sense of where my students are. That is, you know, I have students in my current class everywhere between probably novice high and let's say intermediate high. Again, with some heritage speakers in there with varying levels of grammatical proficiency and their speaking's a little better. Um, and I include a range of exercises um, after we're, so after we've viewed a film clip, for example, they viewed it for homework. As part of the homework, I have true-false online. Then I will do something that is somewhat in between, uh, so slightly demand slightly higher proficiency. It may be identify these quotes from the film, who said this, but it's still fairly mechanical. Then we get to um, actual more open-ended questions, but they usually mirror what was done before. It's just now open-ended, and they have to now actively use the language from the previous ones. These are getting even more difficult. These are more sort of intermediate, mid, high questions occasionally. And then we end with the requirement that they write some sort of paragraph. So I'm, I'm doing the exercises, sort of starting where my lowest student is in terms of proficiency and ending where my highest one is. Making sure that as I get higher, they are the students who have lower proficiency have everything they need there to complete these as well. It's not just write a paragraph about so and so. It's, you know, my descriptions of what the paragraph should be are almost a paragraph long too, because you want to give the students everything they need to do that. We don't want the lower proficiency students to feel somehow, oh, that, that's for those students, that isn't for me. We want to give everybody access to all of these things. In class, Another really important consideration when managing different levels in class 
is the actual dynamics of the classroom. Um, I try to mix things up as much as possible. In class, you're going to have students work in pairs or small groups frequently, I assume, right? Um, pair work ensures that they have lots of opportunities to use the language. You know, when they're working in pairs, half the class is talking all the time instead of just, you know, everybody gets one or two chances a class to um, make sure, I'm going to advocate for this, make sure you avoid the trap of just saying, find a partner, work with the person next to you. Be very deliberate in a sneaky way about partner groupings. Make sure that everybody works with everybody else in the class, all levels. This is especially important for the heritage-non-heritage -heritage split. Those heritage speakers can really intimidate the non-heritage speakers. They have things that our traditional students don't, but our traditional students have things that they don't. Um, and they can really learn a lot from each other. Make the creation of groups part of class, and all of this can be done in language. Just for some examples. I'll do things like, all right, who was born in Jan... We, we do it right here. All right, who in the room was born in January? Raise your hand. All right, that's group one. Who was born in February? And it, mix, and it mixes it up. Absolutely. Um, who, here's, who here lives in Michigan? Group one. Group two. Who here lives in Ohio? Group three. And just... You, but, but what this does is it, it randomizes the groups all the time. Um, pieces of paper that they draw out of a hat. The first half of a sentence, the second half of a sentence. A subject and a verb, something like that. Go find your partner. Make the selection of groups and the mixing up of the groups actively part of the class. Other games as well. I just One day I just couldn't think of anything, so I went to class five minutes early. And as people walked in, I said, that's your partner. The next, per the next person that walks in the door is your partner. If you get, if you get tired, you can even do things like that. Um, note that they all have some sort of flexibility. Who was born, who here was born in July? In August? September? You guys all in the spring? So, okay, three people raised their hand for September, and I know two of them don't get along. <laughs> you two are partner, you wait for October, something like that. <laughs> really, there are sneaky ways of doing it and avoiding those things. Um, I have totally run out of time and am now eating into your lunchtime, no pun intended, so I'm going to stop right there and wish you a very, very successful rest of the seminar. Uh, we could talk for hours more about this. We haven't talked at all about previewing. We haven't talked at all about... Um, identifying cultural moments and how we deal with them, I guess you we'll have to come back next time for some of that. Yeah. There are no dialogues in the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a whole other level, is when we have a film with language in it. Was there any specific reason music chose? I chose this one because I asked who here speaks Russian? No, not at all. <laughs> Nothing we do is random. I hope. <laughs> Do you recommend using foreign language like, you know, Russian in my Hindi class? No, no, no. no. only Hindi. <laughs> only language all the time. Or for just, you know, starting discussion, for example, like, if I cannot find a good introduction type of thing. There must be something. Yeah. So if there isn't, then you find something and you bring it down to the novice level. And that's, that can be done. <laughs> no, like, you know, sometimes, as if you play with the mute sound, and then ask them to like, you know. Some people do that as well, yeah, right? That's like something else. Language, we can do a whole another one on specifically using using film, exactly. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.